Section 1. In this section, you will hear a conversation between Rachel and Caesar. They are discussing a field trip for the following week. First, you will have some time to read questions 1 to 10. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hi Caesar, how are you? Good thanks Rachel, I'm fine. I was going to ring you tonight, so it's a good thing I've run into you. I wanted to remind you about the field trip, the two day field trip next week. Caesar wanted to remind Rachel about the field trip next week, so next week is provided in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi Caesar, how are you? Good thanks Rachel, I'm fine. I was going to ring you tonight so it's a good thing I've run into you. I wanted to remind you about the field trip, the two-day field trip next week. What field trip? The geography field trip to the Warangamba Dam and the water treatment plant. It's a compulsory part of the first year environmental science course. Didn't you know about it? No, I must have missed that piece of information. This is news to me, but give me the details please. Sure. Well, we have to meet outside the library next Monday at 7 in the morning, or you can meet us at 7.45 at the bus station in time to catch the coach, which departs at 8 o'clock. Oh, all right. And how long does it take to get to this place? Well, once we're on the coach, it will take about two hours. Er, uh, no, actually more like two and a half hours at that time of day and it could take as long as three hours to come back the next day because of the evening traffic. And what's the purpose of the trip? Didn't you get the course outline? You don't seem to know anything about this course. Well, remember, I only started at the university a month ago, so I joined the course two weeks late, and I've been trying to catch up ever since. Oh, of course. Well, we spend the first day visiting the dam, I believe we actually go inside the wall of the dam, which is really quite interesting, to see the dam functioning, you know, how much they regulate the water supply each day, depending on how much water is needed downstream in Sydney. Oh, OK. And um, so if this is a two-day trip, where are we staying? Not camping by the dam, I hope. No, no, not camping. They do actually have some overnight cabins near the dam for visiting groups, but we're spending the night in a youth hostel in a town nearby. That's all been arranged by the university. And what about meals? Should we take our own food along? No, you won't need to do that. The hostel provides two meals, breakfast and an evening meal, and we can find a cheap place to buy lunch. Great. So... Is this the only dam that supplies water for Sydney? There are a couple of others too, but this is the main one. Well, with a population of over four and a half million people, I suppose we do use thousands of litres each day. Absolutely. In fact, according to my notes here, they pump the water through something like 20,000 kilometres of pipes and canals and store the water in 262 service reservoirs and each day we use enough water to fill 600 Olympic swimming pools. Now you will have another chance to look at questions 8 to 10.
As the conversation continues, answer questions eight to ten. And what's happening on the second day? Um. Well, we're coming back to town and going to the water treatment plant to see how they purify the water for drinking. Oh, that should actually be quite interesting. I'll bring my camera. Yes, that's a good idea because we're supposed to include original photos for the final piece of work at the end of the course, and make sure you bring a notebook and pen or pencil. Okay, I'll do that. You'll probably need some good walking shoes and spare clothes too, and I would recommend that you bring a waterproof coat of some sort because the chances of it raining are pretty good next week, and a hat perhaps. Sorry, no. I draw the line at a hat. Fair enough. And by the way, do you have a mobile phone? I do actually. Well, bring that along because that way we can keep in touch more easily. Provided that mobiles work up there, of course. That's a point. Do I need a map? No, I wouldn't bother. We won't need to do any map reading. Okay then. See you on Monday, and thanks very much for letting me know. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two, you will hear an extract from a radio program called Consumers' Choice, which gives advice to consumers on how to make complaints. First, you will have some time to look at questions eleven to twenty. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Consumers' Choice, which is the last in our present series. Isn't that right, Wendy? Yes, that's right. But we'll be back again after summer break with a new series. We'll tell you more about that later. But first, in today's program, we start off with the missing photographs. We'll tell you a story of Miss Patty Ching, one of our listeners. We'll tell you how she has qualified for our Consumer of the Month award with her determination. Dennis, thank you, Wendy. Well, Miss Patty Ching went on a holiday to Europe last month. This was her first ever trip abroad, and one for which she'd been saving for ten years. Her tour took her around twelve countries. In twenty-one days, and being a keen photographer, she took lots of photographs, ten rolls of film to be exact. About three hundred and sixty photographs. When Patty got back home, she gave all her photos to top-class photo services for developing, and they vanished. She never saw them again. Of course, she was furious with the company and complained. They apologized and offered her compensation, ten free rolls of film. This made her even more angry, and she rejected this completely inadequate offer and asked for two thousand dollars. The company refused her request, so Patty wrote them a letter telling them to pay up in ten days or she would take them to court. She received no reply. So she did take them to court, but two days before the case was due to be heard, she received a check for two thousand dollars. Top class had obviously made their minds up on how the judge would decide. 
Patty's case provides a lesson to all of us. If we want our rights as consumers, we've got to fight for them. So, for her determination and spirit, we name Patty our Consumer of the Month. Now you will have another chance to look at questions sixteen to twenty. As the conversation continues, answer questions sixteen to twenty. Thank you, Dennis. And now I'd like to deal with the problem that many of our listeners write about: sale prices. When we go to a sale and see a sign on something saying fifty percent off or three hundred dollars reduced to one hundred, how do we know the prices really have been reduced? One of our listeners, Mr. Alvin Locke, tells his story. In a department store where I sometimes shopped, I saw a leather belt priced at a hundred dollars, too expensive for me. But I liked it and thought I might buy it next time the store had a sale. The store did have a sale, and I went back to look for the belt. It was there all right, but the ticket on it now read two hundred dollars reduced to a hundred and fifty. The sale price was actually higher than the normal price. What can we as consumers do in a case like this? The answer to Alvin's question is that at the moment, all we can do is to complain to the store's management and bring these cases to the attention of the public. Bad publicity might help to put a stop to this dishonest practice. Of course, making a fuss about faulty goods or bad service is never easy. Most people dislike making a fuss. But if something you have bought is faulty or does not do what was claimed for it, you are not asking for a favour to get it right. It is the shopkeeper's responsibility to take the complaint seriously and to replace or repair a faulty article or put right poor service, because he is the person with whom you have entered into an agreement. The manufacturer may have a part to play. But that comes later, so it's quite proper and reasonable to make a complaint about faulty goods or bad service. Well, Wendy, what do you think is the right way to do that? Well, the most important thing about making complaints, I think, is that they should be made to a responsible person in authority. Go back to the shop where you bought the goods, taking with you any receipt you may have. Ask to see the shop assistant in a large store. In a small store, the assistant may also be the owner, or you can complain directly. In a chain store, ask to see the manager. If you telephone, ask the name of the person who handles your inquiry. Otherwise, you may never find out who dealt with the complaint later. Even the bravest person finds it difficult to stand up in a group of people to complain. So, if you do not want to do it in person, write a letter. Stick to the facts and keep a copy of what you write. At this stage, you should give any receipt numbers, but you should not need to give receipts or other papers to prove you bought the article. If you are not satisfied with the answer you get, or if you do not get a reply, write to the managing director of the firm, shop, or organization. Be sure to keep copies of your own letters and any you receive. Well, thank you for your good advice. It's nice for every consumer to take an action when he or she gets bad goods or service. And of course, the consumer's choice will continue to press for the government to bring in laws similar to those in other countries to protect consumers. By making it illegal to cheat them in this way, and now I'd like to tell you about our new consumer hotline, which came into operation last month. So far, we have received. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear Dr. Richardson discussing the requirements of a course and the writing of an essay with a student. First, you will have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 28. Enter, please. Good afternoon, Dr. Richardson. Good afternoon. You're David Simons, is that right? Yes. I've got an appointment to talk about the course requirements with you. Fine. Now, why don't you take a seat over there and I'll just get some details from you. First, can I have your home address and your student number? That's 15 Market Avenue, Hornsby, and my student number is C97H85. OK. Now, I see here that you've already completed 18 credit points, but that you haven't done the Screen Studies course, which is normally a prerequisite for this course. Why is that, David? Oh. The course coordinator gave me an exemption because I've worked for a couple of years in the movie and television business and they considered my practical experience fulfilled the same requirements. Fine. Shall we go over the course requirements first and then you can bring up any queries or problems you might have. It might be most useful to start with a few dates. The final examination will be in the last week of June. That's the week of the 23rd. But the final date hasn't been set. It should be the 25th or the 20th, but you don't have to worry about that yet. Before that, as you can see in your study guide, there are three essay assignments and some set exercises. I'll deal with these first. These set exercises are concerned with defining concepts and key terms. They do have fixed answers, not in the wording, but in the content. To that extent, they're quite mechanical and provide an opportunity for you to do very well as long as your answers are very specific and clear. Yes, I see there are about 20 terms here. How long should the answers be? You shouldn't exceed 250 words for each term. Right, that looks easy enough. And the third assignment seems fairly straightforward too. Just a journalistic type review of a recent development in television. It's not so different from what I've done in my work. Yes, it should be fairly easy for you. But don't exceed 1,000 words on that one. Essays 1 and 2 are the long ones. The first essay should be about 2,000 words and the second 2,500 to 3,000. And the approach for both should be analytical. In the first one, your focus should be on TV and the audience, and you should primarily consider the theoretical issues, particularly in relation to trying to understand audience studies. In the second, I'll want you to focus on analysing television programmes. Should I concentrate on one particular type of programme for that? Not necessarily, but you must be careful not to overextend yourself here. A comparison between two programmes, or even between two channels, is fine, or a focus on one type of programme, such as a particular series, works well here. So if I wanted to look at television news programmes, that would be OK? Yes, there would be no problem with that. In fact, it's quite a popular choice, and most students handle it very well. Good. I'll probably do that because it's the area I want to work in later. Later, during the course, Dr. Richardson gives David some advice and warnings about his essay. You now have another chance to look at questions 29 to 30.
Now listen to the second conversation and answer questions twenty nine to thirty. Ah,、uh, come in and sit down, David. You wanted to talk to me about your second essay, is that right? Yes, Doctor Richardson. I just want your comments on what I'm planning to do. I'm doing the essay on the differences between TV news programs at different hours of the day. How many time slots are you planning to consider? Well, I think I'd look at all of them. That'd be five slots: the breakfast news, the mid-morning news, and the midday news. That's three. Then there's the six o'clock news, then the ten o'clock and midnight programs. So that's six, not five. Hmm, that's rather a lot, and you'd have a lot of different audiences to consider. Why don't you just do two, say the mid-morning and then six o'clock? That should give you two fairly contrasting approaches with two main audience compositions. Oh, just two then? Yes, I think that'd be much better. Now, how many actual programs do you plan to work with? I suppose you think analysing a whole week of news programmes would be too many. Well, that depends on how much of each programme. If you concentrate on one particular type of news item, say the sports news or local items, it might be all right. Yes, I can see that would be a good idea. I won't make a decision now before I collect a sample of programmes over a whole week. I'll look at them and see what items appear throughout the week. Yes, that's a sound approach. Now we're getting close to the deadline. Can you finish it in time? Yes, I think so. I've completed the reading and I know what my basic approach is. So it's really just a matter of pulling it all together now. Fine, David. I'll look forward to reading it. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear an extract from a student's presentation about computer viruses. First, you will have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Well, good afternoon. Last week we were looking at the positive effects that computers have had on our society. This week we'll talk about one of the negatives: computer viruses. In today's session, John Upton will be sharing some of the findings of his research project. So, over to you, John. Thanks, Mr. Yardley asked me to talk to you about the project I did from last term. Actually, it's really very rewarding to do this research project about computer viruses. Okay, so what is a computer virus? Well, it is a software program that has been designed, tested, and released by a human programmer with the single intention of corrupting and destroying useful programs. Put in simple terms, it's a way of causing lots of trouble for ordinary people just to be a nuisance. It's known as a virus because, although it's not a biological organism, it functions in a similar way, in that it seeks out a host, 
that is, a body in which to live and multiply, your computer, with the end result of destroying that host. Let's go back 50 years. In 1949, in the early days of computer technology, John Van Neumann presented the first model of a computer virus program in his paper, Theory and Organization of Complicated Automata. Soon after this paper was published, we find reference to a game known as Core Wars. Core Wars was initially created for intellectual entertainment by three Americans working on large mainframe computers. Remember, in those days computers were the size of a couple of rooms. By the 1980s, for the small sum of $2 postage, anyone could get details on how to play Core Wars, and very soon after, we see the emergence of a new pastime, one where people spent time creating programs that could escape the game and destroy other programs. In this way, the first computer viruses were born. Like their biological counterparts, computer viruses are picked up through casual habits. Virus programs are often intentionally placed within useful programs in the public domain, or they're included in software which is not official. That is software you might have acquired on the black market, which, of course, you don't do. It seems quite hard to believe that anyone would go to this level of deceit to intentionally corrupt the data of others, but the rise in the number of computer software infections and the amount of lost data that we are seeing these days is proof that these virus programmers are going to extremes to do just that. They are going out of their way to create programs that hide inside legitimate software applications and cause all sorts of errors that the average end user will then mistake for hardware failure. In other words, they will think that the problem lies with their own computer. So, what can we do to combat these people? Well, the first thing is to realise that virus programmers succeed because people are not always careful about where they get their programmes from. So, number one, be very careful. And I don't just mean that you should be careful about the source of your software. You also need to take care with emails and avoid any messages which are suspicious looking. For instance, a message that says, I love you, or win $50. So, the second golden rule is avoid trouble. Now, there are other things we can do to protect ourselves. We can try to find out exactly how the viruses work, how they accomplish their aims. In other words, we need to understand them. And, of course, there is a good selection of antivirus software available on the market now, as well as on the internet, to combat the virus plague. So another way of protecting ourselves and our computers is to be well prepared. And, before I leave you, let me just say that if you ever run into one of those virus guys, tell them what you think of them. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of listening test. At the end of test, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.